for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Mark Ritson. He's an adjunct professor of marketing at the Melbourne Business School. He also runs the Mini MBA, which is a marketing program run by in collaboration with Marketing Week. He's also writes for Marketing Week on a regular basis as a column. And he's just uh, funny as hell. And you'll find that out in this conversation. But today, we talk about how he's actually incorporated marketing today into the Mini MBA program that he runs. And today we're going to cover brand diagnosis, something that we have not covered on this podcast. Um, and thanks to Mark, we're going to fill that hole and fill out his, uh, his use of the podcast for the upcoming uh, mini MBA series. So I hope you enjoy this wide ranging, but funny and entertaining conversation with Mark Ritson. Uh, Mark, why don't you introduce yourself real quick? Hi, my name is Mark Ritson. I'm an adjunct professor these days at Melbourne Business School down in Australia. And uh, I work for a shit ton of brands on various different strategic challenges. Well, Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, Alan, how are you? I'm good. It's been way, way too long. I feel like it's been like two years since I've had you on this show. Pretty much. And I think you've kind of got famous on your podcast, certainly has, <laughs> since we since we first did it. You know, I mean, I've, I should probably tell you because you don't know the backstory of, about what we're doing here for once. Can I, can I turn the table yeah. from you? Tell me. So, tell me, so tell I me. remember, so if you go back about four months, I did this mini MBA in marketing, which is a... It's an online uh, version of the MBA courses I've taught around the world. And we do it online and we get like 2,000 people doing it all over the world. It's, it's, it's been a great success. But one of the things I wanted to do this year was to have a, um, a podcast for each of the 12 classes because, you know, my, my students are tuning in all, all online. And so I looked around and I've sort of checked out all the different marketing podcasts. And I really wanted to use the same one and have one kind of interview for each of the 12 episodes. And I found this, this one that I really liked, which was yours. And I was like, you know, <laughs> it's pretty good, pretty good. And then I thought, Jesus, you know, I think I was on this. And I, could, yes. I didn't even remember. <laughs> I, I'll be honest with you. I'm like, fuck, I think I was on this. So I looked myself up. I'm like, oh, yeah, I was on this, right? I didn't really. <laughs> but mine was like not very good. But some of them are very good. And then... So I've, I got 11 out of 12. So I found 11 great podcasts and, and truly is that I'll, I'll probably give you some grief in a minute. So let me butter you up yeah. first. I, it really was the best <laughs> podcast in the world on marketing, hands down, you know, in terms of wow. quality of people, the way you run it, the topics you pick, it, it, it was, it was truly great, Alan, truly great. And, and, and so I, I thought, God, that's the one for me. And then the reason we're here today is there was one topic that was missing, which was diagnosis and doing research. And, right. and it's a very interesting point that even the best podcast in the world, and I've listened to every single episode of yours now to find the, the 11, even the best podcast in the world on marketing, man, it's light on, on research and diagnosis. It's all about tactics. And that's not a criticism of you. I think it's a function of the way marketing has gone. No, I appreciate I appreciate that. And to hear you say this is the best podcast on marketing in the world, I mean, that there's no higher praise, I think, than oh, that. Well. So thank you. Well, it's true, mate. It's true. I would tell you if it was only number two. It's um yeah, in terms of the breadth and quality, I, I, I think you've got it cracked. And um Good. so congratulations. Yeah, well done. Thank you. Thank you. I'll I'll ride your coattails as far as I can take it. So but um, well, so let's get into it. I mean, I know to your point, and you reached back out about this diagnosis missing. Um, let's let's get into it. Let's assume for the moment that I'm a new brand leader. I just landed um, in the job. Where should I start? How do I diagnose what's going on with my brand? So I um I think it's the missing art as we've already said and I think there's about in an ideal place there's a, there's about 10 sources of insight that if you're walking into a, an existing brand which usually is the case 
you want to be looking at. And I'll do them in no particular order, but I'll, you know, I think it's a great checklist. And I, and I don't expect the brand managers I work with to do all of these every time. But these are kind of the stones you look under to find out what have I got with this brand, yeah? So I think you start with location. Uh, brands come from a certain place, and the, you have to visit the physical place where the brand was born. Um, uh, and the example I often use with clients is I did, in, in a very famous week, I did the brand strategy work for Dom Perignon in France, and then I had a day off, and then I worked with the, the team from Moa to Chandon to do their brand strategy, and they are in the same group. And they're actually only 15 kilometers apart. But if you if you visit Haute-Vierre, which is the home of Dom Perignon, and then you visit Chateau de Saran, which is the spiritual home of Moet, even though they're pretty much not only in Champagne, obviously, but the same part of Champagne, they are stunningly different. You know, you feel the heavy, powerful almost foreboding that you get from the home of Dom Perignon. You know, it's, it's a monk, it's a monastery. And you go to Saren, it's a chateau with a discotheque. I lost my trousers there. You know, it's fun, <laughs> it's crazy. And, and it's, a, it's an extreme example, but it illustrates the point. You get such sense of a brand just from visiting HQ or increasingly where it was born originally. So you start there. Link to that is heritage. I think, you know, Americans have so many advantages when it comes to brand management, and they did write the book, but they're not keen on going backwards to go forwards. So I think studying the archives is always useful and always something that is, is should be done early in the diagnosis. Uh, then you get to founders. You have to spend time either with living or dead founders. Dead founders, much easier than living ones because they don't move around. I've worked with both, and I prefer the dead ones because you can read about them and you don't have to manage them. But I think the founder's DNA is is always, to some degree, injected into the brand. Uh, and then, of course, any secondary data. So that's kind of like your initial sweep of material about the brand. And then, really, it comes down to two major pieces of empirical research for me. I love loyalist research. So the first thing you're going to do if you're a new brand manager with a new brand is you're going to get out and recruit some customers. You're going to find out why they love the brand. You're going to shut up, which is very hard for many marketers to do. And you're just going to listen to the loyal customers who spend their money on the brand telling you why they love the brand. And it's the dirtiest, cheapest, easiest insight of all. And rarely does it not give you the answer. What do I want more people to think and feel? Well, here it is right in front of me. Let's start with the guys that already think and feel it. Now, this is, you know, obviously very qualitative, and it's either done through ethnography or through one-on-ones. So at some point, you really do need a decent survey of the whole market to then test and see where the gaps are, what the drivers are, what the funnels look like, and so on. But that comes relatively late in the process. And I'd say the only other really strong bit of diagnosis that I think is too good to miss is – Let's assume you've done all of this. You've studied heritage. You've done the qual. You've done the quant. You've got a pretty good idea how you want to position the brand, how you want to execute it. Leave a bit of money for focus groups because the greatest piece of research on the planet remains focus groups with your potential target customers in your that are in your marketing plan, and you get an hour and twenty minutes in a room with them. And, and that's the most valuable hour and 20 minutes of all diagnosis because you can check the segment portrait is correct. You can test your positioning versus other options. You can run through some tactical ideas. It's a brilliant final test that if you've kept 10% of your budget in your back pocket just before you start you know, driving this thing, you'll improve it another 50% literally with one or two hours of focus groups. So for me, that, that, that's, the, that's the broad group, right? I, if I saw that taking place, and you very rarely do, I'd say this is proper first-year diagnosis, and, and it doesn't have to be that much in year two, but in that first year, you've got to get your hands around the brand. Right. And that, that's what we mean by a proper diagnosis. Got it, got it. Well, and one thing I did not hear was social listening or – scraping my digital data, uh, my data lakes, my digital data yes. lakes. Yes. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's because it's, it's a load of shit, Alan. I mean, <laughs> let's be clear. So let's look at Twitter as an example, right? And forgive me because the stats aren't completely correct. I forget what I was right. reading last week, but I love Twitter. It's fantastic. It's a tiny echo chamber, which has, you know, 15% of the population active on it. And of that 15%, I think it was another 10 to 15% are doing 80% of the tweeting. So you're getting the tip of the tip there. And I, I have to tell you, it's not getting any better out there. I look at campaigns have objectives set on, you know, social media objectives. They, as to your point, they use social listening. Look, it's a decent secondary qualitative tool. What's good about social listening? You get it straight away. Uh, it's immediate. It can be ongoing. It's cheap. It's hugely unrepresentative of the market, so you can never use it for quantitative purposes. It's a qualitative tool. And it's only taking insights from a tiny fraction of the market. So, yeah, it has its place. I put it in into secondary data. But, you know, it's the same old story. There's nothing wrong with it, but it, it's nothing particularly good about it either. But it predominates our discussion now because it's digital, and digital is everything. Right. Right. Well, it's refreshing to hear, you know, your approach to this and, and how you go about diagnosing, how you're teaching people, frankly, that's great. Um, wh why do you think, so, I mean, you, you kind of beat me up a little bit, which is fine. It's appreciated. Uh, why do you think it's so hard to get CMOs and brand leaders and people behind the campaigns to talk about this, like the steps that they went through? Because it is like pulling teeth. Yeah, no, I, I can imagine you've tried. I think it's a fundamental ignorance of how to manage brand, even at quite senior levels. So one of the things I do when, I'm, when I start off teaching brand management at, at business school or we start working with a team is you, you split up brand management into three distinct slices. The first part, diagnosis. The next part, strategy. The final part, tactics. And I weight them equally. I say they're each about a third in year one of your time should be diagnosis, strategy, tactics. That never happens, Alan. You look at even a decent brand manager, right. they've got Facebook or Instagram out or they're talking to their agency before they've even worked out what's in this brand. And, and I call that tactification. So we've become, you know, and your, your podcast, through no fault of your own, is a victim of that. We've become a, right. a, a, a tactically obsessed discipline that really – it, and it isn't just tactics because, you know, within marketing tactics, we have things like price and product and distribution that we don't talk about anymore. We've become essentially a communications obsessed discipline. And it isn't just communications because we don't talk about radio or PR, God forbid, promotions anymore. We talk about digital comms. So we've been hijacked. And, and your podcast, I think, is a brilliant reflection of marketing at, at the moment. And as a result, you've been hijacked too. If you really ask I think some of the marketers you've had on, you could probably split them into two camps. Half of them mm -hmm. haven't really done much diagnosis, so they can't talk about it. And half of them are living in a milieu, which is, mm -hmm. well, you wanted to learn about how I'm using tactics, right? Because that's marketing, not the boring research bit. And, and as we all know, without, without that foundation of understanding and strategy, the tactics don't work. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to kind of, goad you a little bit mm -hmm. here so i've got this diagnosis done um and now am i working on the positioning of the brand or am i working on defining its core purpose and why i exist so uh, first thing i would say is they are the same thing so a position right. and a purpose i mean so again my take on all of this born from years of, of frustration and learning and so on is that I don't mind if you call it brand purpose or brand position or value proposition or brand attributes or brand associations or brand image. The point is you, you've only got room for one concept, which we could broadly call the intention. Yeah. What is our, mm -hmm. what is our stated intent on this planet? What do we want to be known for? What do we, how do we want to play the game, et cetera? Where I begin to become frustrated with brands is when I see a pyramid and with seven things inside it, and then I've got an essence, and then underneath it, I've got my purpose, and now I'm going to add my, you know, my brand flavors. And before you know it, you've got a a, a ten slide presentation, the dreaded brand book, and all of that gets in the way of doing what we're trying to do, which is get into the consumer's head. So 
if, if a company says to me, look, we think we have a brand purpose, which is about doing this, I'm fine with that. The question is, are you basing that upon what we've learned from the diagnosis? Or have mm. you just read that you have to have a purpose because it always works and that's what's cool right now? And I fear in many cases, not all, but in many cases, it's the latter. If you can show me from the diagnosis that target customers really want purpose, yeah, and if you mm. can show me um, that your competitors are lacking in, in those uh, attributes and that performance and that you can deliver on it, I'm right there with you. But okay. my point is I, I'm skeptical a lot of the time that that's the case. And instead, we've got people who are afraid to admit they, you know, it, I'm going to be very cynical and I suspect quite accurate. It's really hard mm -hmm. for people who live in Manhattan and in London and in Berlin to go to a dinner party and say, oh, what do I do for a living? I sell carbonated, caffeinated beverages or I sell <laughs> hand cream. Yeah, or I sell oil and gas for people to fuel their cars. That doesn't go down well around the dinner parties of the of the uh, bourgeoisie. And so I think when you're able to say, no, 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 I, I don't sell carbonated, caffeinated beverages. What I'm about is about freeing the world from tyranny and an ideology of, of conformism. Suddenly heads are nodding. And, and I'm afraid that's half the battle. I think, you know, if you look at Unilever, which is one of the great companies in the world, I think it's right. been hijacked by people who are ashamed to be marketers and who would rather yeah. do something more worthy instead. And I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. I don't see any reason why we can't support a multitude of causes um, and be incredibly um, sensitive to how we live our lives. But there's also nothing wrong with generating a profit or making a great product or service, and for that intrinsically to be a rewarding and wonderful contribution to society. So you know, I struggle with it a lot, and I'm certainly completely in the minority, and I look like a buffoon because of it, but <laughs> I just think a lot of it is imposed and doesn't come from the brand or from the market. No, I would, I would totally agree that it's likely – in many cases, it's not coming from a true diagnosis um, and understanding of the brand and what people believe or what people think about it. But I, I and I, but I do think it works for some brands. Um, yeah. And I'll use one example just because I have a pair of these shoes. They are the most uncomfortable shoes on the planet, and I haven't thrown them out because <laughs> I'm, I just, I just don't, I, you know, I, I don't know what to do because that seems like. Uh, bad for the planet. Um, but it's Tom's shoes and it's a great yeah. company. They have a great mission. They have a great cause. People buy them because they know they're giving shoes to somebody else. Well, I'm about to give my $70 pair of Tom's shoes to somebody else because they hurt my feet. Um, and I guess it works um, for that brand because there's no other differentiating like utility value to that shoe that I can think of. Yeah, and to be fair to Tom's shoes, like Patagonia, they were set up with that purpose in mind. I mean, they, they, their genuine DNA is wrapped up in, we aren't just about selling shoes, we are genuinely about providing shoes in developing countries. And I think that, right. that was part of their founding principle. I think where I get a little less convinced is when organizations – you know, I mean, Gillette is the case in point, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it, there is room, don't get me wrong, for a very 21st century view of masculinity, which is more sensitive and, and isn't tied up in 20th century uh, stereotype. But the way they did it was so heavy-handed, and they're hypocrites. They, you know, they're still charging more for women's razors versus men's razors. So why don't we start with that? Rather than telling men how they should be living their lives in a very heavy-handed and frankly, almost insulting way, why don't you charge the same price for each razor blade head to women as you charge to men? That would be a great way to start, wouldn't it? Rather than telling us how we should behave, why don't you behave <laughs> that way first? You know, and we have the same thing with Starbucks, building, you know, building communities, paying no tax in many of the countries they operate in, or paying, you know, legally reducing their tax, which is fine, right. not illegal. But if you're about building communities, we need hospitals and schools, man. We don't need to be told 
that you're doing it. We just need you to do it, pay your fair share of tax. So I think it's, for me, that's the dark side of it. And and if you want to go really dark, there's an argument that many companies are saying this because they're fully cognizant of the fact that they're not doing it, but they're giving a smokescreen for their their actual activities. Not P&G or Starbucks, but there are other companies right. where purpose washing is certainly working and is, is part of the process. And my argument to you, Alan, and you might disagree, is we have never lived in, in, in less purposeful times. We have <laughs> never been yeah. more lost in terms of the organizations and leaders. Just look at the ratio of what a blue-collar worker at one of these large companies earns versus the CEO. It's uh, bullshit. It's, yeah. it's just bullshit, man. I mean, on any level, it's bullshit. So, yeah, I, I really think it's when purpose is there, let's celebrate it. And it's a wonderful thing if it's an authentic thing. But let's not let's not be hypocritical about it. Let's not be ashamed of making good products and services and just generally behaving in a respectful and an authentic manner. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Totally agree. And that Gillette example is brilliant. I, I use that in an advertising class that I was guest lecturing for. And um, so funny enough, in the same lecture, I was showing an old ad that actually won an Effie award. So I want to get to your work with the Effies mm. here in a minute um, from Tangare, uh called, I think the campaign was something like Tonight We Tangare. And uh, funny enough, the class ended up getting to the to the point that one, the Gillette ad about talking about masculinity and basically shaming all men um, just was not the right tone. It wasn't the right execution either, but it just wasn't, wasn't right for yeah. the brand. And this ad from Tangare tonight, we Tangare was, would, would have been a brilliant Gillette ad if they had just put Gillette at the end <laughs> hmm. um, Interesting. and basically achieve the same thing, but being closer to on brand about what masculinity means in a world. So I'll share the clip with you later. I'd love to see that. Yeah. yeah. Cause it was a missed opportunity. You could feel it. Like if Gillette had embraced yeah. all the things that masculinity should be and made it aspirational, I think it would have been a slam dunk that that's the sad part of this. You know, it was a real miss, a real miss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's there's still an, an opportunity for them to figure it out. But yeah, I agree. Total miss. Well, so let's talk about the Effies. Uh, you've been doing an analysis from what I understand, um, you know, over the last, I think, 50 years of the Effies to see what delivers effectiveness. I'm a big fan of the Effies. Um, one of the few brand, one of the few awards, if any, that actually focuses on the results, yes. the money making aspects. <laughs> yes. So what are you learning? What are you learning? Well, so I got approached by Tracy Alford, who's the CEO, a global CEO of the Effies. I'm a big fan of Tracy. And I'm with you. I've all, I grew up on the Effies. Um, they were bigger in the States than they were globally, but they've started yeah. to now really become global. And for your listeners, you know, the Effies not for creative or for big brand size or anything else. It's exactly as you put it. It's what were your objectives and how effective were you in achieving them based on your communications? And they were born in 1968. So we're officially our 50th year looking back now. And it's been a great honor to go through kind of every single submission, not just every winner, but every single submission. And we were up to, uh, not all of them are recorded in the old days. Obviously they were in paper, but we're well up to past about 8,000 cases. And these cases are meaty things, you know, like they're big, meaty fellas. And you do feel like you're absorbing half a century of, of, of marketing strategy. And, yeah, I'll go out there at the end of May for the 50th anniversary and talk about what I've learned. But um, in a nutshell, it's many of the things we've just been talking about. So, you know, what, what do we see really working? You definitely get a sense that the brands obviously that do a diagnosis and understand things before they strategize work best. You definitely get a sense that strategic priorities are really important. So I can't prove it yet. We haven't run the numbers, but there seems to be a negative correlation with the number of objectives and, and actual effectiveness. So you, you, you only want really to, to try and achieve one or two things, even though there might be 10 things that are attractive. Um, a real sense of positioning, um, obviously, but over a long period of time. So you really begin to see there's only a couple of brands. Apple is the most notable one. You could put IBM in there too. 
who have developed a position and then just held it for 20 or 30 years. And all the other brands, every three years, they're moving around, you know. So I think that that yeah. sense of positioning over the long. The thing that nobody talks about in America, which is a shame, is distinctiveness. So we have a big debate about <laughs> differentiation right now. You know, does it really exist or not? And there's probably a dominant view outside of America that it, that it doesn't, excuse me, that it doesn't. And that really all brands are pretty much perceived the same. I, I disagree with that. I do think that differentiation is oversold in American business schools. You, you can't own an attribute. You, you don't have unique, you know, mm. unique associations or even particularly strong ones vis-a-vis the competition. And the data holds that quite very clearly to be true. But I do think the combination of two or three associations well executed gives you a form of differentiation, much weaker than we normally talk about. But I think the big lesson is really that distinctiveness, as opposed to differentiation, has been wildly understated in the market. And and everyone gets confused by these two words. But in essence, differentiation is about my relative position in the mind of the customer versus competitors. So am I seen to be different? Whereas distinctiveness is my relative position to the consumer. Forget about competitors. Do I stand out? Am I noticed? Do I do I achieve salience? Am I first to mind in buying situations? Do I look like myself? And although it sounds bloody obvious, mm. again, if you look at 50 years, most of these <laughs> brands are too clever. They're changing all the time. They don't play their, their obviousness. And so what happens is because a brand manager lives the brand, you know, eight hours a day for 10 years, they think, well, everyone knows we're Snickers or Verve Clico or whoever else. So we can kind of move on to kind of being right. being you know, innovative and different. This is a big mistake. Most customers don't actually know it's you most of the time. So you have to overdo your codes, your assets, so that they know that it's you. And I tell you, you see it very clearly. Snickers is the brand I'm using to illustrate it. I think they've been run brilliantly over the years. Because Snickers is brown, Snickers has got that particular slanted logo, and it, it, it's there's nothing genius yeah. about that, but the way they've played it is fantastic. And then two more, if if, if you may, two more lessons. Um, yeah. Scale. Americans will hate this scale. Um, <laughs> the the biggest ROI uh, factor is that you're already a big boy or a big girl, and you get more from your add dollars as a result. And the reason I say Americans hate it is they're always wanting to tell the David versus Goliath story and how Goliath, you know, the DTC movement, how small brands are you know, nimble and agile. It turns out to be pretty much horseshit. So what happens is the big boys are big enough to outspend the small boys if the small boys try and actually get the same level of share of voice. And the big boys have an inherent advantage, which is you get more bang for your buck when you're already big because you're already feeding a beast that's already been built. And so you really get a sense here that there's an unfair advantage. And if you look at that correlation, share of voice, share of market, it's pretty standard now that big brands can have a much bigger share of market than share of voice. And smaller brands, unfortunately, have to have a much bigger share of voice relative to their share of market. And there's not a lot you can do about that. And you certainly see that coming through. And the last one I really want to celebrate when we do the actual presentation is creativity. Mm. And I don't mean the agency wank creative, you know, creativity, (laughs) blah, blah, blah. I mean that if you look at almost every discussion everyone's having at the moment, it's about media and it's about channels and it's about AI. And no one talks about whether the work is any good or not. And it stuns me. It stuns me that, you know, there are, Dave Trott quotes a famous, very famous ad guy in the UK saying, um, and I've forgotten his name now, so I'll get into deep, deep trouble. But Dave Trott quotes that famous ad guy that sh- talking about the current you know, obsession with media, that shit delivered at the speed of sound is still shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, and that summarizes yeah. it perfectly. Yeah, most of, most of our discussions, if you look at ad age or you look at, any of the major sort of discussions in our field at the moment are all about media. Well, 
it depends what you're putting on that media. And I've chosen um, the Tide ad from the Super Bowl last year, which is a relatively recent one, because there's nothing clever in that. There's no real media choice. It was just the most brilliant, creative, amusing idea executed fantastically and and we just don't talk about that enough we just don't talk about it and you know what i mean if you look at the actual quantitative data yeah. it looks as if and, and i'm you know drawing a, a thick line between a bunch of work by a bunch of different people but essentially that about a four to one ratio that your creative is about four times more important than media but in our industry we pretty much spend four times more of our effort discussing media and programmatic than we do about, well, yeah, but is the ad any good? You know? So I think we have that to- totally <laughs> wrong, which sounds screamingly obvious, but it isn't obviously because no one's doing it. So you mentioned something to me in email about this notion of post digital marketing and why it's such good news. What are you talking about? Yeah, it, it is me. slightly good news. So, We've lived through a decade where the dreaded D word has pretty much followed us everywhere and and made us focus on the future and focus on tactics and focus on communications and focus essentially away from the past and on strategy. I really feel this year for the first time that we are starting and only just starting to get to a place where we've realized that digital is kind of dumb word now right because it's like saying you know i'm talking right. to you on an electric computer you know what i mean it's it's become <laughs> endemic right you know and i mm-hmm. i use when i talk to people i say well you know they keep talking about digital and i say well what do you mean by digital and they say well it's different from traditional and i say well what do you mean by traditional give me a traditional advertising media and it's it's like shooting fish in a barrel because they say well news media and i'm like yeah the new york times has 1.5 million print subscribers and 4 million digital subscribers it's a digital business and they say well what about you know outdoor and i'm like yeah 70 percent of outdoor is now digital it's a digital business radio is listened to more in both the us and the uk digitally than it is on on a broadcast mechanism now so the point is we've you know digital has changed the, the marketing world but it, it it's now changed it so completely that we have to forget about it. It's oxygen. And the reason that's good is I really feel there's a lot of brands stopping with the toys and stopping with the, oh, we've got a new thing, you know, called WeChat. We can blah, blah, blah. And they've really started to begin to think about, oh, shit, what is our strategy and what are we trying to do here? So I feel a little bit of a renaissance coming, a change of temperature in the water, that if it keeps going – might get us to a more sensible, strategic place. Not that we don't need the tactics, but that they don't occupy us 95% of the time. Well, it's funny. Now that you describe post-digital, I, I get it. And uh, actually had, this probably fuels your fuels your thoughts um, as well. I just had Amy Fuller, the global CMO of Accenture on. Hmm. And to hear her, she even described a post-digital world. There you go. Um, which I was like, you know, for for agencies that are chasing Accenture, they think they have to be more digital and more about digital transformation. And Accenture's already out ahead of that, essentially saying, no, it's a post-digital world now. Um, and so that's interesting mm-hmm. and very in line with what one of the, you know, global digital, if you will, <laughs> providers of the past have, have been focused on mm-hmm. too. So mm-hmm. very interesting. Leading indicator, maybe, maybe. Well, I, You've heard podcasts uh, of mine, obviously, um, and it's important to me to understand the person behind the content that we talk about. So I love this question, you know, is there an an experience of your past that defines or makes up who you are today? Yeah, I guess. I mean, what would it be? I mean, I suppose I grew up in universities. I mean, I am still an academic. That was what I wanted to be. And I think mm-hmm. the the most important moment for me was I got myself by hook and by crook onto a scholarship at Wharton in the mid early 1990s as a young PhD student. And I'd always loved marketing and I was doing a PhD in marketing and I got to Wharton and I saw 
some men and women who were professors of marketing who were having an impact on businesses. And as obvious as that sounds, I'd never seen that before. And I didn't even know that it existed. And I guess I hadn't known I was looking for it until I saw it. But here was Paul Green, who invented Conjoint, Jerry Wind, who's, you know, a famous marketing strategy expert, just wandering around, Pete (laughs) Fader. These guys are, you know, they, they, people listen to them in industry. And I'd come from the UK where, A, most marketing professors had never worked in marketing, and B, none of them really wanted to do marketing. Like they were kind of not interested. They always had, when you met them at conferences, they always had some kind of, I want to be a comedian, I want to be a historian, I want to be a social worker. It was like, does no one here want to be a fucking marketing professor? And so I got to Wharton <laughs> and I was just, yeah, that's who I want to be. And, and, and it was the impact on business that was the absolute metric of my desires. It, and it wasn't money and it wasn't, you know, commerciality. It was the fact that you could be practical and and also still teach and be a professor. And I just thought, God, God, that's so good. And, you, you know, when you're 25, you're like, I don't know if I can do that, but God, that's so good. And I think that was right. the moment. I And I came back to U- the UK and then went back to the States. And I never really looked back. And to the point where, I, you know, 20 years later, someone was telling me, you're not really a, a, a professor because you're more of a consultant. You're not really a business school academic. And I said, no, let me, let me stop you there. I'm a business academic. I'm a business school academic. The problem is what you are doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? I don't see how you teach marketing without working in marketing. I don't get it. You know, if a professor of surgery has to do surgery to become a professor, there are thousands of marketing professors, well-meaning, lovely people that have not done what they are teaching and researching. And I believe that that's horseshit. Um. Well, a couple of quick questions for you. I'm curious if there's any advice you'd give your younger self, maybe that 25 year old or. Oh, yeah. Earlier. Get laid more. <laughs> um, I was honestly, I, I look back on the, like, you know, I'm an old man. I'm very happily married. And it's not like I didn't have fun, but it's like I was quite good looking. I'm, I surprised myself. I, I had a pretty low, <laughs> low self, not, you know, not bad self esteem, but I really didn't think I was much of a much of a good looking fella. And I look back at the pictures of me now, I mean, they're 30 years ago. Like I, you know, I wasn't John Travolta, but I was okay. And I probably should have got, <laughs> you know, I should have got about a bit more. I'd say that was, that would be, that would be my three seconds in the time machine. I would say, listen, you know, you're all right. You, you should, you know, have a go there, have a go there, you know? So that's probably, I love the, it. that's probably the one. Yeah. Oh, I'm afraid to ask my next question, which is, what is the, what's the most absurd thing you're thinking about right now? Absurdity is not my specialty, although others would probably disagree. <laughs> The most absurd thing, I guess, is what have I got percolating? I mean, I suppose it's kind of, I'm pretty certain it's possible to continue. I, I, I'm, what am I now? I'm nearly 50 and I'm going to retire at 55 because I've got enough dough and I've got a young family. And I was thinking last week that it's almost certainly going to be possible in five years to continue to operate with an, an artificial intelligence replacement without anyone noticing. Cause you don't really, I don't do a lot of physical stuff anymore. I mean, this interview, for example, I wonder if five or six years from now, could <laughs> I, you know, I talked to some crazy sales guy who told me I, he could sell me a, an artificially intelligent sales rep yeah. that would email people and handle calls and send me leads and stuff. And I thought that's gotta be shit. So I looked at it, and no, uh, you know what? It's pretty good. I mean, and he he sells like the you have to pay the guy the the AI guy a wage and stuff. You know, it's kind of interesting. Right. So I thought in five years' time, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't if I rather than retire, I'm just going to replace myself <laughs> and see how long that lasts for. Right. It's kind of. I mean, I'm already getting it right. So this mini MBA, it's very peculiar. I filmed the first set of classes two years ago. And so I go to London for me, you know, we do big recruitment things for the program and they're big images of digital me walking around and digital me is way more impressive than real me. I mean, <laughs> I did a ton of swimming before I did the first teaching. So I'm relative, relatively thin. I'm less gray. I'm on time. I'm not hungover. 
I'm always on cue. <laughs> I walk around. I say the right things. I don't say fuck, you know, because I've edited it out. And you get this sense that people are increasingly disappointed with real Mark and that digital Mark is, is, is a lot more attractive. You know what I mean? And you can see, I meet my students who, you know, it's, it's a very interesting experience. Teaching digitally um, in a sort of virtual manner is far more impactful than doing it in a classroom, which really surprised me. I, I, I was almost disappointed, you know. But when you think about it, teaching in a business school, is a, it's a 15th century model of instruction, right? I mean, people don't uh, come yeah. by horse and carriage. But otherwise, here's an amphitheater. Here's 100 people. Let me <laughs> shout at you for, for four hours. And so right. what's happened when people do this on the phone or on their, on their computer, we do establish this much more nuanced, intimate relationship. And it, it means that teaching is far more effective. But then you meet these people afterwards and they share these 12 weeks with you, a, a slightly younger, more dynamic, more intelligent <laughs> version of you. And you can just see they're really kind of disappointed with the real version of you. You know what I mean? They're really like, right. yeah, okay, it's you, but it's not the you that I, I got to know on the laptop. You know what I mean? You're old and right. you're, a bit, you're a bit hungover. And, you know, you just seem a little off, off, off message. Right. And it, I can feel it. That there's a palpable sense of disappointment in, in real me. So, yeah, why not? So I think that's probably it, that I can create a fully uh, uh, fake version of myself and head off into the sunset while still earning loads of cash from my doppelganger. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, last couple of questions for you. Where do you get your best source of information? There is so much crap out there. Yeah. So I'm curious, what, where do, what are you reading? I've been pretty, um, I've been pretty fastidious about how I use LinkedIn in the sense mm. that I, I really do follow people that I think know a lot more than me about things, and I, I genuinely still see it as a channel that gives me more than I give back to it. I think a lot of people mm. use it to broadcast their thoughts, mm -hmm. which I do too. But I think its real value for me is there's about I, I, no more than a hundred people, but that's a big you know, peer group yeah, right. who are either like-minded or opposite-minded to me, but are smart and you can always get value from them. And then I know this sounds weird, Alan. The other thing I'd say is fuck Google, man. Nobody appreciates yeah. Google. I mean, if you right. go more than 30 seconds on Google, you can find anything out. Like I say it to brand managers when we're doing the, the diagnosis sessions, I say, sit your ass on Google for two days. And they're like two days. I'm like, yep. Two days, you will <laughs> uncover. You know, it's if it wasn't there, we 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 would we would appreciate it more. So I think just being able to, yeah, LinkedIn can give me a sniff of something, and then a proper amount of time on Google can can reveal anything. I think. Gotcha. Well, last question for you: Is there an opportunity that you think marketers should be capitalizing on, capitalizing on right now? What are they yeah. Missing? Definitely. I, I think the, the, the key thing missing around marketing is strategy. And yeah. I think I, 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 I despair. There's all these sort of strategy gurus who are kind of like coming out of account planning or just have like sort of strategy as a general sort of focus. In it. And they just talk shit about strategy. Strategy is storytelling. Strategy is narrative. Strategy is challenge, right? It's not that fucking difficult. And I think the opportunity for a decent marketer uh, to double down on is don't be afraid to go and work on your strategy before your tactics. And I'll be very clear, right? I, all I say to my brand managers is there are four questions I want you to answer. I don't even fucking care if you answer them correctly. Just have a go at answering them and you'll be in the top 5%. That's how bad we are right now, yeah? And the four <laughs> questions are, Tell me which brands you want to operate and by definition, which ones you don't, because usually there's too many brands in the mix, right? Tell me who your target is. That's a massive question now, thanks to Byron Sharp. And I, when I work on brands now, I do give him half the credit. I go after the whole market and then I go after target segments. But that, that, that aside, what's your, who are you actually going after? And the answer could be everyone. The answer could be one segment. It could be a mix. But you have to have clarity on that question. Yeah. Then we get mm -hmm. to positioning, purpose, whatever, you know, whatever, however you want to define it. And, yeah. and then finally, a couple of clear objectives. So, you know, are we trying to drive consideration? Are we trying to increase awareness? Are we trying to 
improve satisfaction, just a couple of smart objectives. And if you can answer me those four questions before you bring in the team from Google and your agency, et cetera, I think that's the opportunity that you will stand out so much compared to everyone else because I don't see it a lot. I have to be honest with you. As basic as it sounds, I don't see anyone with a page, and it has to be a page that just summarizes this is how I'm going to play this year. And I think that, for me, if I was talking to a, a junior brand manager, I'd say you need to bone up on your strategy, take some time out to do it each year, have it clear in your head, have some confidence, and, and then, and only then, go into tactics. I think it's a, a huge missing part at the moment, and, and, and it's not getting any better. Love it. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Alan. I've now got my... Uh, I've now got my episode to play back to my wonderful mini MBA students on diagnosis, which fills my gap. And I've got 11 other of your episodes uh, to fill my mini MBA. So thank you. It's, it's, it's really is a great help to me that you've made these podcasts and keep going, mate. There's so much shit out there that um, having you doing these and I do listen to them. I do think is um, it's really good work, man. So keep going, keep going. Thank you. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, social media support by Megan Woods, art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners. and You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.